Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We're teaching on listening to God and we've been talking about the prophetic process by which the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts and we can hear the voice of God. Now I'm not comparing every Christian to the prophets of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, but one of the great gifts of the New Testament believer is that we receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us about God. When Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come, he said the Spirit would teach us about all things. It's the Spirit who gives us the conviction concerning God's Word. He confirms God's Word and we understand that this Word of Scripture is the very Word of God. It's the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit also testifies to us and gives us the assurance that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit leads us with the revelation of Abba, Father. In other words, it's the Spirit of God who testifies to us that we belong to God. And so this relationship with the Holy Spirit is a prophetic relationship. In other words, the Spirit speaks to our hearts. The Spirit witnesses to our spirit. And this is the basis of a life of listening to God. The same Holy Spirit who can convict you of your sins and the truth of the gospel and to show you that you are really a child of God if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. That same Spirit who leads you to faith is the Spirit who leads you on in your faith. And one of the most important aspects of this work of the Spirit in our hearts is helping us hear the voice of God. The Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian believers that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would come to them. He prayed that the eyes of their heart would be opened, that they would know Jesus better, that they would grow in their knowledge of God. And so we can truly speak of the Holy Spirit's illumination, that revelation of the Spirit to our hearts. Now in recent programs, we've seen how this revelation operates through the gift of prophecy. We've seen how that in the New Testament, people were called to be prophets to pass on God's words. But we also saw that at a congregational level, ordinary believers can be moved by the Spirit to speak words of encouragement and comfort to one another. And this is a very precious gift that we can have as we speak to one another encouraging words, not just human words of encouragement, but words given by the Holy Spirit, words which are relevant to speak into people's lives. We've seen how personal prophecy also can be very encouraging as it ministers to our lives personally. But in all of this, there must be the sense of testing and judging to see if this revelation is real. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit teaching series, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. And we're looking at listening to God. And we're coming today to a very, very important teaching in this whole series. And it has to do with judging prophetic revelations. All that I've been saying throughout this series points to the fact that God does speak to us and that we are called to listen to Him with hearing, obedient, humble hearts so that we might do what He tells us to do. But throughout it all, I've been warning that we must be careful to check out these prophetic revelations. Otherwise, we could be deceived, misguided, and maybe go into error or get into confusion. It's very, very important that we know how to test all forms of prophetic revelation. So we have to say to ourselves, how do we know that what we're listening to is God? 
or whether it is our own imagination, something coming from our own heart, our own mind, or our own human personality, or worse still, whether that is coming from the enemy, whether it's something that the devil is doing. Now, I don't want to give you too many alarms because the truth is the Holy Spirit is more powerful than any demonic spirit. The Holy Spirit's more powerful than your own human spirit. And if you are truly ready and humble and and meek before the presence of the Lord, saying, Lord, here I am, I really want you to speak to me. And if you are truly open to the voice of God, you will hear his voice, and that voice will crowd out every other voice. It will, it will silence, silence the voice of your own heart and spirit and you'll hear God's voice instead. It will silence every demonic voice and you will hear God's voice. But you do need to know the importance of judging prophetic revelation. I'd like you to turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and in the first two verses we read, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Now, what we see here is that God has always been speaking. Now, in the past, the writer of the Hebrews says, God has been speaking to our fathers through the prophets. Uh, in... in uh, various ways and at various times. And and the understanding of this is that the revelation that God gave through the prophets was fragmentary and varied. It came in lots and lots of different ways and there was a fragment here and a fragment there. But the writer of the Hebrews says, God in these last days has spoken definitively in His Son. In other words, this is a contrast In the Old Testament, these were fragmentary and varied ways that God spoke, partial, incomplete revelation. But now, through His Son, through the one act of sending the Logos of God, the one act of sending the Son into the world has brought the full, final, complete revelation of God. Now, we know that in that revelation also was a provision that God, would, that God made to make sure that there would be a scripturated form of that revelation. In other words, that includes both the Old Testament Scriptures and the New Testament Scriptures. So God has spoken fully and finally in His Son, in the person of His Son, the living Word, the Logos, as well as in the written Word. So we have these three basic ways that God has revealed him to himself, himself to us by the supernatural means of inspiring the prophets, of sending the Son, and also of causing the Scriptures to be written. Now, in each of these things, we have an infallible word from the Lord. The prophets spoke as God sent them, and they spoke the very words of God. Jesus is the living embodiment of the Word of God. He is the Word of God. He never uttered any falsehood. Jesus gave a full and final and complete, definitive revelation of God. No error there. And the Scriptures were God-breathed, and still are God-breathed. Every Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 2, verses 15 and 16. Another translation, All Scripture is God-breathed. In other words, it's the breath of God. When God writes Scripture, it's it's His Word at work. And what is written here is exactly what God intended to be written. It's His revelation of His mouth, His Word. Clearly, there is no room for error here. God acted supernaturally to keep all of this revelation totally free from error. And there is no sense that we should ever feel we need to come and judge what the prophets say, is this right, isn't it right? Or judge what Jesus says, is this right, isn't it right? Some people have in their Bibles, I do in mine, the words of Christ in red. (laughs) We know it's infallible, it's correct, as indeed the other scriptures. We don't judge the Word of God in any of these forms. The Word of God judges us. So when we now talk about God speaking to us in ways other than these, they must be judged. They must be judged. They must be tested to see if these are indeed true and valid revelations of God. And so we come to see how we can do this. The importance of judging and testing prophetic words and revelation that we believe is from God. Testing and judging those things. We cannot ever overestimate 
the importance of testing out to make sure that what you're hearing really is God. Now, we know that uh, the apostolic word that was given in the original revelation of God through the gospel is an infallible word. And since that apostolic era, God has continued to give revelation concerning his word to our hearts and to the church. But we must recognize that these revelations do not carry the same level of inspiration as the written word of God or indeed the living word of God, Jesus himself. Now we've seen how in the New Testament the gift of prophecy must be judged. And if it is to be judged, it means then that it cannot be at the same level of God's written word because we don't judge this word, but we do judge prophecy. So that tells us even in the New Testament itself, there are, in the New Testament era, there were some who spoke infallibly, the apostles and prophets who laid the foundation, and there were some who spoke in a way in which the inspiration was lesser than the inspiration that was given to the infallible prophets and, and apostles. And so we see, and I've put in the manual for you, a number of arguments to substantiate this. For example, in 1 Corinthians 14, we can see that the gift of prophecy did not carry an inspiration that extended to the exact words spoken by the person prophesying. Because it seems, really, that what God did was give a gist of a revelation which was then expressed fallibly through the personality of the people prophesying. That's why it had to be tested. 1 Corinthians 14 prophecies could contain error, and they had to be submitted for scrutiny and judging. There is no suggestion that the Corinthian prophecies were to be either recorded for posterity or passed on to other congregations unless there was a clear direction for, of God to do that. And this distinguishes be prophecy between the Word of God. God's Word in Scripture is God's Word for everyone, all the time, in every place. Whereas a prophecy is God's particular Word for those people in that place at that time. Now, where there is an exception to that, it's because there is a, a specific prophecy that God is giving one church, and he says, this is in line with what, with what I'm saying to all the churches, just as it was in the book of Revelation, chapters 1 to 3. It, the word constantly there was, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And so, what they had to do was to listen to what God was saying to other churches, because that was going to help them, and it was good to be in touch with each other and to be a blessing to one another in that kind of way. But what I'm saying here is that Scripture is God's Word to everyone, all the time, everywhere. But a prophecy may be applicable, actually, in a much more limited way than that. And so, we also see that uh, prophecies in 1 Corinthians could be given only in part. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 30 said, But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. So the idea is, is that you may be halfway through your prophecy, and, and then, the, then the Holy Spirit touches somebody else, and then they then must, must carry on. And you say, but I haven't quite finished yet. And that's a very significant part because Paul was correcting an attitude in Corinth where people were hogging the platform and they were drawing attention to themselves. And so there are times when you may need to hold back and defer somebody up to somebody else. And in doing that, there may be some things that you've not yet been able to express and maybe never able to give those prophecies publicly. And that means, of course, then that there were some prophecies which weren't expressed and that shows you that these prophecies weren't as important as the written word of God. Can you imagine God saying, oh, there's a book that I forgot to write. I haven't got a chance to get around to doing it yet, but hang on, I'll get to it eventually. That's impossible. This is the complete re record, written record of God's word. So prophecies could be judged. Prophecies could be withheld here and there. And also, we need to see that there was clear indication that these prophecies were not at the same level as the prophecies that Apostle Paul give. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14, verses 37 and 38. Here, we see what I've just been mentioning. The Apostle Paul pulls inspirational rank over the prophets there in Corinth. In other words, he says, listen, 
I have apostolic authority and the words that you say must be in submission to the words that I say because I'm speaking directly the words of Jesus Christ. That is a very, very tremendous claim. If anybody makes that claim to you today, they are claiming falsely. There is only one claim that can be made today like that. That's the claim about scriptures. Scriptures are infallible. Today, there is no human being that's infallible. No one on earth. Uh, and so, when somebody says, listen, you better listen to me because I'm giving you the direct words of God, they are falsely usurping an authority that they should not have. But the scriptures do have that authority. Let's read these verses. And you, you look how the Apostle Paul pulls rank on them in terms of his authority and inspiration as an apostle, as one of those foundational apostles. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Can you hear this? He is correcting the prophets in Corinth who were prophesying with a lesser degree of inspiration than he was. And he was saying, if you really are a prophet and you really are spiritual, you will acknowledge that my words are the direct commandments of Jesus Christ. When I prophesy, I prophesy out of my anointing as a foundational apostle, bringing you the infallible words of God. That's what Paul said. But he says, when you prophesy, you must prophesy in submission and tested out by the words that are spoken which are, are apostolic, with those apostolic words. And then it goes on to say, if you, if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. That's the New King James Version. But you see, when it comes to the New International Version, it says, if anyone ignores this, let him be ignored. In other words, anyone who rejects this truth, who rejects this apostolic authority, you are setting yourself against the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are so many people who talk like that today. They say, I have got direct revelation from Jesus, and if you don't listen to me, you are rejecting Jesus himself. There's no way that we can speak like that prophetically today. We can say it if we are giving people the infallible word of God of Scripture. So, for example, if we say, Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, I am the way. I am the truth, I am the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. We can say on the authority of the Scripture, if you reject Jesus as the only way to God, you will not be saved. Jesus is the only way to God. If you refuse to come by him, you will not be saved. He is not just a way, he is the way. And I tell you infallibly, without contradiction, if you reject Jesus Christ, you will be rejected. Now can you see, I am speaking with great authority, but I'm basing my authority on the written word of God. Now there's a very big difference from me saying that and then me saying, now listen, I believe the Holy Spirit wants you to take this step and to take up this particular ministry. I believe God has been calling you. I believe you know this in your heart. And I really believe it's God's will for your life. But... You have got to be the judge of whether what I'm saying is truly the word of God to you or not. You understand that? There's a very big difference between prophesying and in declaring God's written word to people. And so we must submit all of these things to the scriptures and to every other test that is necessary to make sure that these prophecies and this prophetic revelation is tested. Now... When we come to do this, let's remind ourselves of the principles that we've learned so far when we begin now to apply the tests. We learn that the purpose of all revelation is the knowledge of Jesus. It's that we might know God better. Everything else, direction, insight, prediction, empowering, comfort, edification, all of these things are secondary and they are part of the process of leading us to Jesus so we have a revelation of him, that we're very, very clear about it. Now, one, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 18, is a very, very clear statement about this. Paul's prayer for the Ephesian believers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation 
in the knowledge of Him. And then it goes on, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling, hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. But the key thought here is the spirit of wisdom and revelation is in the knowledge of Him. New International Version says, for the knowledge of Him, that you may know Him better. It's for the acknowledgement of Him. It's that you may know Him better. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is there that you might know Him better. He reveals Himself to you. So you can see a very, very te big test straight away. Does this really bring us to the knowledge of Jesus Christ? We've also seen that the purpose of revelation is to build the church. In Ephesians 2.20 it says, The church is founded upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. And so prophecies are there to encourage, to build up. It's there for edification, church building. We are being built together and we're being built up. We are called to do this. And that's how we test as to whether somebody is truly prophesying and this revelation really is revelation from God. We also see that revelation is given in order to release God's power for His will to be brought into being. So when Jesus walked in the Spirit, and when Jesus listened to the Father, He did what He saw the Father doing, and He said what He saw the Father saying. saying. So that means the power that Jesus experienced came as a result of the revelation God gave Him. God does not give power for what He's not doing. So in other words, if God isn't doing it, you can't do it. And if you're going to minister in power, you need to first of all submit to the initiative of the Spirit, receive the revelation as to where you are to go, how you are to minister, and as specifically as necessary. So when God speaks to us in revelation, we know that it's for these purposes. It's there that we might know Jesus better. It's there that we might be built up and encouraged and be strengthened in our faith and be strengthening one another. And it's also there to release God's power, the effective operation of His power, that His will may be done, that His will may come here on the earth. So that's the background for us coming to look at this question of judging revelation and judging prophecy. Now, when I say judging revelation, if it is real revelation from God, then that's what we're seeking to judge. We're testing to see whether this is revelation. We're not judging the revelation itself. You understand there's a subtle difference, but it's very clear. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 to 22, Paul puts his finger on it by saying, Do not quench the Spirit. And as we read this, what, look at the balance that the Apostle Paul brings. Do not quench the Spirit. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Do not despise prophecies, but test all things, and hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. What tremendous balance. He says, don't quench the Spirit, don't despise prophecies, but test all things. And when you've done that, you've got to do two things. You have to hold on to that which is good, and abstain from every form of evil. So there's the suggestion here that when prophecies come and revelations come, we need to sift through that, find out what really is of God, hold on to that, follow that passionately, and what is not of God, you, you can't just say, oh, well, that doesn't matter, we leave it on one side. You have to actively abstain from it, which means renounce it and do not let it enter your spirit because we don't want you to be polluted and we don't want you to get involved in things which are not from God. If you aren't as clear about rejecting what is wrong as well as holding on to what is right, you can still be in difficulty. You don't just shrug things off, especially where they're very clearly wrong and in clearly in error and people are prophesying out of the wrong motivation and it's very, very difficult, as we shall see, to... to well, it's very important to reject those things. In love, but it's very important not to have these things still upon you and in your spirit. Because we only want the purity that comes from the Holy Spirit. I don't want somebody else's problems, somebody else's emotional problems, or their sensual uh, prophesying and fleshly thoughts to be put upon me. 
I want to be, have enough of my own to deal with. I don't want anybody else's. And I want to be completely, have that behind me, and I want to stand on, on, on the promises of God's Word. So I want my spirit kept clear and pure so that I can receive the pure Word of God and that I can also be a vehicle of that Word to others. And so, in the church today, there is a fear of false prophets and false prophecy. And at times, that can lead people to despise prophesying. I've, it's very hard to find any publication, any book, or any Bible teacher that is totally balanced on this. And by definition, therefore, I'm probably finding it difficult to, to, to strike the right balance. On the one hand, you want to release people into prophecy. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that it's regulated and that we keep the error out of it. Some people seem to be so, so harsh in their judgment that they squeeze out the Holy Spirit altogether and, and quench the Spirit. Some people put obstacles in the way of the Holy Spirit. They're all release and no regulation. Some are all regulation and no release. We need to get a right balance here, as in all things. Mm -hmm.